I'd like to speak today about a, a more controversial subject, uh, something that's uh, plagued the church for many, many centuries. Uh, whether it's okay just to sing a cappella, or whether it's, it's okay to sing with musical accompaniment. And I'd like to look at the scriptural background and some of the historical background to this question that's, as I say, has basically plagued uh, the church down through the centuries. We'll see if we can make a little bit of sense out of it. Singing. Christians have the responsibility to speak to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, according to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. We're also to teach and admonish one another with songs, Colossians 3, 16. So the question is to play or not to play. The question of the use of instruments in worship, are they acceptable? Uh, are they helpful? Are they uh, divisive? Or what's the problem? I asked to tell you a story I, I received from uh, an older brother. He said uh, one Sunday, it was a big, baking hot July Sunday evening in the early 1980s in Liverpool. Into the service came two teenage girls, about 16 and 17 year old. We'd never seen them before. They may have seemed a little flighty, but they were not there to create trouble. They appeared to want to be there. I was the speaker that day, and the service was to be about angels. Consequently, we had a normal opening hymn, but then we had two hymns either side of the reading, from Luke chapter 2, about the birth of Jesus, where angels feature most strongly. Consequently, the hymns reflected a topic, topic and, and where hark the angels, herald angels sing, and while shepherds watch their flocks by night. The sermon actually had very little to do with Christ's nativity. However, in the middle of the latter hymn, these girls jumped up and all but ran out of the door. And as they went, one was heard to say, No organ, singing carols in July. It's a madhouse, this. I understood something then about the expectations of people in the world on the topic of carols and Christmas, which is not part of this study, and about how we present ourselves to the world. We often forget that what we take for granted, visitors find most strange, and will label us as peculiar at best and mad at worst. <clears throat> so why are we different over the pra practice of the use of instruments, or, that, or rather the non-use of instruments in worship? That's from Graham Fisher. This is an emotional topic. Within our wider community, there are many views in the playing of instruments in worship. Those range from brethren who allow it and use them through to those who do not use them, but who will sing and are not upset by it if they find themselves worshipping in an instrumental context. To those who will not have any instruments under any circumstances, who will also switch off the radios or televisions or hear a hymn being sung to a musical accompaniment. There's no doubt at all that listening to good organ music in a cathedral or similar large church building can move the hearer. It, tends, it sends tingles down the spine and thrills the soul, even perhaps making you think you're having a mystical religious experience by being there. As the hymn writer puts it, Loud organs his glory forth tell in deep tone, and sweet harp the story of what he had done. O oh, praise ye the Lord. A primary reason for believing instrumental music is not to be used in worship service is Jesus' statements about worship. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus made a very telling statement. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Thy God's word is truth, he says. These are not conflicting values, so are different ways of expressing the same thing. This fruit is red and round as opposed to this fruit is red and green. We have to be led by the Spirit. In this passage and in John 6, 63 and all through the New Testament, the Spirit is contrasted with the flesh. They are opposites. Learning this has helped me to see that spiritual does not mean emotional. Spiritual means I give up my own desires and subject them to the Holy Spirit's teaching and commands. Many who love the majesty of church organ music would reject the logical consequence of allowing organ accompaniment to singing. 
These consequences can be found in many denominations now where rock bands rattle the rafters, thrilling the worshippers. Once you open the gate, the floodwaters can rush in. This is one good reason why using instrument music is unwise. We don't find any reference to offering music as worship to the Lord in a Christian context. Consequently, we can feel assured in saying that where a musical item, simply as a musical item, is presented as worship, it is wrong and totally unauthorised. Thus we hear in a worship service that today's organ solo will be Bach's. Such an offering is out of order and wrong. We have been positively told to sing. We may have not been told to play an instrument as an act of worship. Is it consequently wrong to accompany a hymn by playing a musical instrument? What then has been offered to God as worship? That seems to be the critical question. Worship and what is being offered. Worshiping God is nothing if it is not an interaction between the human and the divine. It is not meant to be entertainment, nor is it necessarily fun, though there is nothing at all wrong with it being either. It is where in humility the inferior recognizes and honors the superior. When we worship in song, we are sometimes singing praises of the divine, sometimes praying and petitioning him, sometimes dedicating ourselves to serving him, etc. We do this by the words we sing, not by the music, nor by the quality of the performance. The tune is not important, it's merely a vehicle through which we express the words. Often there are several tunes which all fit the hymn and different congregations will have different preferences. The quality of singing is not important either. It is good that we give our best to God in all that we do. But if we're all frogs and croak the words or sound like a cat's chorus, we're no less acceptable to him than if we sound like a BBC symphony orchestra chorus. Thus, four-part harmony is good if you can do it, but we must never sacrifice the sentiments. We are singing on the altar of sounding good. It's what our hearts are singing, which is important to God. Therefore, if an instrument is accompanying the hymn, what is being offered to God? The music or the tune? No, because that can be valuable. The quality of the singing? No. Instruments do not guarantee quality. They only guarantee more noise. What is being offered are the sentiments expressed in the hymn, and these come from the hearts of the worshippers, not from the instrument. If the instruments were to stop playing in the middle of a verse, the words could still be completed without it, and God would be worshipped just as truly. If an organist soloist dries up in the middle and that has been offered of and that was being offered to God, the worship would cease at that point, from the worshipping and song point of view. The accompaniment or absence of it is irrelevant. It is only there to provide some sort of help with a tune for the worshippers. So why is it shunned in Christian worship if that's all that it's there for? In fact, Paul tells us anyone who is spiritual has to acknowledge the things he wrote at God's commands. This does not sound like most people's definition of spiritual. It's also significant that Jesus told the Samaritan woman that God must be worshipped in spirit, while she was trying to justify her erroneous religious practices. The songs we teach and admonish each other with are to be spiritual songs. There's just nothing spiritual about a mechanical instrument. It may be pretty. It may be emotional, it may produce absolutely gorgeous music. But it isn't spiritual, it doesn't, it doesn't teach and admonish. The sound doesn't even get above the roof. If we decide to include a mechanical instrument as part of our worship, are we making a spiritual decision? No, no way. There are only two motivations for this. To be like everybody else, that's a fleshly decision condemned in 1 Samuel 8. Or to please ourselves. That's another fleshly decision contained in the scriptures. One might say it makes the worship better. But that is just our opinion. We are just pleasing ourselves. We might say we are more uplifted. But what we really mean is we get more emotional during the music. Who is to say what builds up the church besides God? God has told us what he wanted. And it didn't include an instrument. If we do otherwise, we have left the realm of spiritual thinking and gone back to fleshly, worldly things. The New Testament pattern. All of us are prone to fall in with the popular concept that whatever is, is, is right. 
as children born to the scene we find ourselves surrounded with a, a church already functioning according to be to accepted patterns of thought and method. It's quite natural for us as we develop in our mental and spiritual capacities to accommodate ourselves to what we find about us on the supposition that that is what the Bible teaches. Perhaps as a child we attended somewhere where the organ was used at every service, the normality of this was taken for granted. Later we might have found the piano, the organ and even an orchestra occupied a place of more or less prominence in all the different religious groups we knew. Nor did it ever occur to us to question the presence. We accepted this always being part of a church worship and testimony. This experience is quite typical among many religious people today. If we then were invited to attend a little meeting of believers gathering in simplicity to the name of the Lord Jesus, all would seem so different from anything that we'd ever seen. There's no organ, no musical instrument of any kind, nor any sign of a choir. The singing was congregational with no visible director. All this might seem quite peculiar, nor would we feel at all attracted by the strange simplicity of it all. Why do people worship like this? Where is the organ? Are they nuts? When we begin to inquire and make proper study of the situation, we begin to find out that, from the beginning of the history of the Church of God on earth, down through the Apostles' time and on the early centuries and thereafter, instrumental music in any form did not play a part in the worship of the Church or Gospel testimony. The use of music in early, early congregations, the, the Jews had both instrumental music and a cappella unaccompanied singing in their worship, and each was as acceptable to God as the other. The Psalms give plenty of references to instrumental music. Psalm 150 is an excellent example. Thus the church could have adopted either both forms. However, church history confirms that it rejected the use of instruments, and they only appeared after many centuries of unaccompanied singing. This could not be simply coincidence for the church was guided in all aspects of its witness by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit obviously wanted it that way. The two practices were found in separate traditions in Judaism. The temple tradition was for using instruments, but the synagogue tradition rejected them. They still sing a cappella in Orthodox synagogues today, where the songs are led by a cantor. The church followed the synagogue tradition under inspiration, of course. As we said, the temple was the home of the liberal thinkers or Sadducees, and the synagogues were the preserve of the more conservative thinkers, or Pharisees. The church was to be guided by conservative forces, not liberal ones. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He had a Pharisaical contempt for instruments in worship. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul begins his great treatise on love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. In the next chapter, Paul uses instruments in a negative manner. Now, brothers, if I come to you and I'm speaking in tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things, referring to, that makes sounds such as flute and harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet doesn't sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? Gongs and cymbals were temple instruments, as were flutes and harps. The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, a liberal publication, has this to say on the topic, under the section on music. The superiority of vocal over instrumental music was a general tenet of Christian aesthetics. Paul's contempt of musical instruments was based upon the Pharisaic view. The later Christian authorities had much more reason for their antagonism against all instrumental music. The pagan theatre and circus with the licentious female musicians attracted vast masses of Gentile Christians who were accustomed to these spectacles. The wild vigils of martyrs' anniversaries of various only slightly camouflaged popular festivals disguised as memorial days of saints were the occasions when instrument, instrument music was taken for granted. The church needed three centuries of severe legislation 
to eradicate at least the worst of these orgiastic customs. There you have it. The church considered vocal music to be vastly superior to instrumental music, and so it is. Bad a cappella singing is dire. Bad accompanied singing is dire too, no matter how much drowning out the organ can produce. Good accompanied singing is marvellous, but the climax, the acme of all singing, is to be part of good four-part a cappella singing where the vocal harmonies blend beautifully into a crescendo of spine-tingling euphoria of moving religious proportions. It leaves you on a mystical high you can never experience when accompanied. Professional choirs might get a similar experience under constant conditions, but we are talking about regular congregational singing, not concert class entertainment. Far more importantly, the association of instrumental music to licentious behaviour is not peculiar to the first century or even the first three centuries. It's just as common today. That little old lady picking a tune on a harmonium is not going to lead the worshippers into licentiousness. It's hardly the point. From such beginnings we have rock bands being introduced with dancing in the aisles and behaviour which could not be described as decent and in order. The instruments have taken over and distract from the worship, a thing which cannot happen with a cappella singing. Music has its place and purpose in worship of the congregation. This place and purpose has been created by divine authority. In that place and purpose we must remember and recognise the importance of the kind of music authorised, the purpose music serves, and the manner in which it is rendered. Let us remind ourselves what the proper Christian or church dispensation did not begin until the day of Pentecost. When our Saviour was on earth, he told Peter in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church. Not, I am building my church. Not, I have built my church. But I will build. It was still future. The actuality of the church as a present functioning body upon earth takes its beginning from the day of Pentecost, as described in Acts chapter 2. This is definitely substantiated by the word in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. The first time the word church, properly assembly from the Greek word ecclesia, is used in Acts to designate this new body is in chapter 5, 11, and great fear came upon all the assembly. So we're quite sure of our ground if we conclude that we must conclude, confine our investigation of apostolic practice in the church to those portions of the New Testament which come after the four Gospels. The first thing that strikes us as we examine the book of Acts is a silence as to anything resembling present day use of musical instruments in the church. In fact, the only mention of singing in the whole of Acts is on the occasion of the imprisonment of Paul and Silas at Philippi. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. We feel confident no one would think of a musical instrument in that dark and inner dungeon. When we go to the epistles, we find the same utter silence as to the use of any mechanical helps to Christian worship or testimony. Let's see a list every occurrence in the New Testament epistles which make mention of music or singing. If God intended musical instruments to have a place in the congregation, would he not have made known to us somewhere, either in 28 chapters of the book of Acts, or within the body of the 14 letters of Paul, the three of John, the two of Peter, or those of James or Jude, to give his sanction to instruments of music? How striking is the fact that, which now bulks so large in thought and practice of present-day Christians, should have no mention in these 22 communications written by six different servants of the Lord and covering a period of approximately 70 years. What about the last book in the New Testament? We should not be surprised we find frequent mention of singing in this book of heavenly triumph after the suffering and trials of earthly pilgrimage. Nor is it the song of angels that greets our ear in this ap apocalyptic book. As far as note, there is no biblical record of angels singing. They are not redeemed as we are. Clad in this robe, how bright I shine, angels possess not such a dress. Angels not a robe like mine, Jesus, the Lord, my righteousness. Though angels praise the heavenly king, and to him their Lord adorning own, we can with exaltation sing, he wears our nature on the throne. In the second place, we must keep in mind reading Revelation. It's a book full of symbols. 
Dr. A. H. Barton in his pamphlet, The Symbols of Apocalypse, briefly defined, lists no less than 200 different symbols in the book of Revelation. Logically, then, one must not put too much emphasis on the literality of what we meet in this most remarkable unveiling of the future. For instance, though we readily acknowledge the fact that the 24 elders symbolize the glorified saints, we would never for a moment take the number 24 literally. Actually, we believe the numbers will be beyond our computation. If we have no difficulty in seeing the symbolic significance of the number 24, why should we hesitate to regard the harps as wholly symbolic? Dr. Burton, in his book above, referred to list, list the harps as symbolic of choral service of praise. Furthermore, if we want to press for literal meaning in the heavenly harps, then we must also accept the company figures in their literality. We must add harps, instruments of music, to our assembly, worship and testimony, because we find harps in heaven. Then we need to be consistent and add also golden bowls and incense, the golden altar and the crowns upon the head. To sum up so far, we can say with assurance of the real will of, the God, of God as found in the New Testament, doctrine and practice, that instrumental music has no place in the apostolic church. Should it mechanical instruments of music in worship be a matter of opinion? Many in the religious world for years have contended that, that the, they, the instruments, were aids or expediencies, and that one could worship God acceptably with or without their use. Does it matter if what we do in worship or any other practices without scriptural sanction or authority? Christians claim to believe in the authority of Scripture, and so in this modern age, if we want to abandon that now, surely we would need to have sufficient reason for doing so. May the Lord continue to give us the courage, wisdom, and love of the truth to continue contending for the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. We need unity in the religious world and in the Church of the Lord, but it must be based on truth, not on the principle of compromise. Let us prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Psalm 68, 3, 4. But let God, re let the God re rejoice. Let them be glad in God's presence. Let them be filled with joy. Sing praises to God and to his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. First Chronicles 16, 8, 12. Then on that day David delivered for the fastest psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvellous works that he had done, his wonders and judgments of his mouth. Sing praises to the Lord. Raise your voice in song to him who rides upon the clouds. Yahweh is his name. O oh, rejoice in his presence. Interesting. As classic verses for scripture of music in the Old Testament or well, in the New Testament often used. Uh, first, for example, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Across the top of the other page it says, Ephesians 5, 19 to 20, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chronicle says, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalmetries and harps, according to the commandment of David and of God the king Seer and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Daniel 3, 5, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Amos 6, 5, that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Let the word of Christ dwell in your hearts richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This verse is rich with application. The most important point we made here, and one that is highly skipped over by most, 
is the obvious statement there. We are, we are to let the word of Christ dwell. That's the emphasis. It's not the Psalms, the hymns, or the spiritual songs that teach and admonish. It is the word of Christ that teaches through these. The singing is a means, not the power in teaching and admonition. A second application of this verse and found in part Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There seems to be a direction away from the Psalms, away from the hymns. Even many today just want spiritual songs. People today seem bored with Psalms and hymns, and so spiritual songs becomes all they want to sing. They slap them up on their overhead screen and clap and sway with some of the most fluffy, worthless spiritual and praise songs. Another application refers to singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We all need to have grace regarding our singing. We are to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But we certainly can't claim loud for loud's sake or because of the speakers and amplifiers, nor can we consider polluting praises as singing with grace. When a congregation sings with grace, the rafters will shake. It will not be because of the rhythm section of the band or the keyboard, nor will it be the foot stomping teen section in the back of the church building. It will be because there are true praises being sung unto God, to his name and before him. Psalm 64 shows us three ways for us to sing unto God. We are to praise, extol, and rejoice. First Chronicles 16, 7, 12 says, Then our day, David delivered first his psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto the Lord upon his name. Worship, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto them, sing psalms unto them, talk of his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord with his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he had done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Some say that mechanical instruments of music and worship to God is simply a matter of opinion, and the opposition to such is an expression of legalism. Those who reject the instrument of worship are just being stubborn. One argument advanced in favour of mechanical instruments of worship is the idea that God commanded them in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 29 verse 25 says, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalmetries, with harps, according to the command of David, and of God the king Seir, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord. Before we move on to this, the, from this particular passage, it certainly mentions uh, cymbals and harps, but notice he said it in the Levites. He set the Levites in the house of the Lord. These were men. These were the priestly tribe. And it was only them, not the whole people of Israel is involved here. This is a, a twelfth of the tribes that's involved. And it's, it's the men that are involved in the uh, temple worship, not the women. Where does Ephesians 5.19 fit into this picture? Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing, making melody, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Psalms are song of praise. Hymns are worship songs. Spiritual songs are re songs of rejoicing. Remember, praises are at others, from me, to him. Extolling is to him, from me. Rejoicing is from me, from him. The word extol is not a common word today, but obviously it is the word of God. What God wants us to know it and use. Extol means to raise in words or eulogy, to praise, to exalt, in commendation, to magnify his name. From me, at others, to him. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among men, sing unto him, sing, sing psalms unto him, talk of all his wondrous works. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts. Psalms are meant to be sung. What do we sing? The use of instruments under the old law was confined to the male priests and Levites. The privilege of belonging to which was based upon natural descent. They formed a separate and exclusive order to which none were admitted but those descended from a particular family. The priests then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. All the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Haman, Jeduth, 
and their sons and relatives stood on the east of the altar, dressed in fine linen, playing cymbals, harps and lyres. They were accompanied by a hundred and twenty priests sounding trumpets. There's the music being used in the Old Testament, but it's very specifically being used by very few people, a special group of people, in worship to God. Amos 6.5 says, Woe to those at ease in Zion, who invent themselves instruments of music like David did. Or you sing foolish songs to the music of harps. You make up new tunes just as David used to do. Or croon to the sound of the lute, who like David invent for themselves music, instruments of song. First Chronicles 23 verse 5 says, Four thousand praise the Lord with instruments which I made, said David, to praise wherewith. David's music and his instruments were for God's praises. The rank and file Jewish worshippers, including all the women, did not play instruments and would have been disobedient if they had presumed to do so in a worship situation. The instruments listed in Psalm 33 and 150 were not optional, they were commanded. There are over 20 kinds of musical instruments mentioned in the Old Testament with which we can praise God. So to obey the command of God, we must use the harp, the psaltery, the instrument of ten strings, the trumpet, the timbrel, the organ, the cymbals, etc. There are over 500 direct references to singing. Most people are not even aware of the role that music played in the well-known story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. In fact, music played such an important role that verse 5 is repeated in verses 7 and 10. When the action gets thicker and the same command is repeated one more time in verse 3, 5 to 7. That at that time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the sulphur, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoever falls not down and worships shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that the Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. <coughs> so, as one becomes more and more aware of the power of music, we must realise the issue is far more than good or bad music. All kinds of music can make anyone bow down to the golden image, even today. The Holy Spirit works through words, not music. Some of musical events in scripture, Moses' song of deliverance, uh, all that should make a sound, musicians help the workmen, music at the burnt offering, 128 singers, 148 singers, a new song unto the Lord, song of Moses, song of the Lamb, 339,000 musicians, priests sounding trumpets to all, 4,000 instrumentalists, sing with loud instruments, 200 singing men and women, singing, 245 singers, sing thou art worthy, harpers harping before the throne. 153 specific verses concerning harp, organ, ram's horn, tablets, psalteries, cymbals, trumpets, cornets, nigoniths, flutes, sackbuts, dulcimers, viols, pipes and horns. There are verses that mention instrument music as holy instruments of music, loud instruments played by skilled players on stringed instruments. There's even a reference that could be applied to today's music as being written and invented by our own selfish use not for praising God. The New Testament writers alluded to many of the Old Testament Psalms, none, including any of the references to, re to instruments. If the use of instrumental music in the Psalms was intended to serve as a precedent for Christians, you would think at least one reference to instrumental music from the Psalms would be mentioned in the New Testament. As Methodist commentator Adam Clark noted in his remarks in Psalm 81, he must be ill off for proofs in favour of instrumental music in the Church of Christ, who has recourse to practices under Jewish ritual. To prove that instrumental music were commanded in the Old Testament proves nothing in connection with them being permitted in the New Testament. Does the fact that God commanded the offering of animal sacrifice in the Old Testament make it an option in the New Testament? The law of Moses was abolished or removed by the cross. God wiped away the written code with his strict orders. It was negative. It was against us. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. By his death, he ended the whole system of Jewish law that excluded the Gentiles. 
His purpose was to make peace between Jew and Gentiles by creating in himself one new person from two groups. For us to revert the Old Testament to gain authority for a practice in the New Testament is to handle stolen goods, but this is simply meant that one is taking that for which he has no right. Further, if one is going to take a position that instruments can be used in worship of God today because it was commanded in the Old Testament, it appears that one would be forced into the position of all things that are commanded in the Old Testament are things that may be used in worship today. Some say that God has never objected to mechanical instruments of music, thus there is no law for forbidding him, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. The basic premise of this argument is all things not specifically condemned by God are things which are permitted. Just a little thoughtfulness along this line will show the weakness of the position. To my knowledge, God has never specifically condemned burnt offerings, burning of incense, having coke and cake in the Lord's table, counting of beads and worship, etc. Are these things therefore permitted? Are they a matter of opinion? The fact of the matter is, the Bible does not have to specifically forbid something for, it, for, it, has, for it to be condemned. All God has to do is specify what he wants done. If all we do is to be, by the authority of Christ, instruments of music are not authorised. They are therefore forbidden. If any man who is a preacher believes the apostle teaches the use of instrumental music in the church by enjoining the singing of psalms, he is one of those smatterers in Greek who can believe anything that he wishes to believe. When the wish is far to the thought, correct exegesis is like water on a duck's back. This is the same basis that prohibits, prohibits infant baptism and sprinkling. They are not authorised. God is nowhere specifically forbidden sprinkling or infant baptism. But he has specified who are to be baptised, believers, and how they are to be baptised, immersed in water. Some say that mechanical instruments used in worship to God are just like using songbooks, pitch pipes, and tuning forks. The reasoning is that songbooks, pitch pipe, and tuning forks are aids to our singing, and are optional. may be used, but they don't have to be used. And so contend that mechanical instruments are also an aid, and are optional relative to their use. The pitch pipes and tuning forks have only one function, that is to get the pitch which aids the singing. The song books simply give the lyrics and notes of the song, thus serves an aid. <clears throat> but the mechanical instrument is music in addition to singing. Someone wrote these words speaking of the great value of the congregation worship, worshiping God in an uplifting voice, an uh, uplifting song. It's almost impossible to overestimate the value of good congregational song service. It stimulates and animates the church to its highest degree of spiritual devotion and worship. It gives an opportunity to every member of the congregation to express the praise and thanksgiving of his or her heart and prepares it for the reception of God's eternal truth. It enriches, broadens and sweetens life. It strengthens the faith, faith and discourages uh, faint and discouraged soul with a new faith and a new hope. It pours the oil of gladness into wounded and sorrowing hearts and revives the drooping spirit to life. It turns the thoughts of weary pilgrims from the conflicts and crosses of this life to the eternal existence where no shadows ever fall, to the home not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Remember our different kinds of worship, some acceptable to God and some that are not. First, God rejects and does not accept ignorant worship. God doesn't receive worship that is issuing from the heart of the will worshipper, who is only doing what pleases himself instead of creator. Neither is God happy with worship based on the tradition of men, the creeds of men. This kind of worship is styled in the scriptures as hypocrisy and vain worship, empty and worthless. How close can we be to God in order to worship him? Unto God unto the Lord, unto thee, unto him, unto our King, before him, before the Lord, before his presence, before the throne, to his name. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, have been made near by the blood of Christ. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he will be with me. We know very little about worship today, but we brag about our emphasis on preaching, we miss worship by a mile. Church services are becoming orientated around entertainment rather than worship. The God of modern evangelical rarely astonishes anybody. He, God, manages to stay pretty much within the Constitution, very well behaved, very denominational and very much 
one of us. We are here to be worshippers first and workers only second. Out of enraptured and admiring, adoring souls, God does his work. The work by, done by a worshipper will have to have an eternity in it. The church has surrendered our once lofty concept of God and has sub substituted it for one so low, so ignoble, as to be utterly unworthy of thinking worshipping men. The whole new philosophy of Christian life has resulted from this one basic error, Tozer says. True worship can only take place when we agree to God sitting not only on his throne in the centre of the universe, but on the throne that stands in the centre of our heart. God is not moved and impressed with our worship until our hearts, our hearts, are moved and impressed by him. One of the great scriptures commanding singing and worshiping God, Paul taught singing as an individual as well as collective act. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing, make music in your heart to the Lord. The command to speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs is a reciprocal action of each worshipper. <clears throat> singing worship to God is unique in that every worshipper in the same manner and the same time can pour out their hearts in praise to the Almighty God. Whether we are ex excellent or average or poor as a singer in the sight of God, what counts is that it comes from the heart. Acceptable worship must be spiritual, issuing from the spirit of the worshipper and in truth as God directs in his word. Let's have a look, closer look at the word sallow. Romans 15.9, as it is written, For this cause I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing unto your name. I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. In the midst of the church I will sing praises unto you. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Ephesians 19, speaking to each other in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We could also add just for example, say Jesus and the disciples after the psalms have been sung, they left for the Mount of Olives. Note that nothing in any one of these seven references carry with it the slightest suggestion of musical accompaniment. The melody mentioned is distinctly stated to be that in your heart. Paul expresses to the Corinthian congregation, So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, I will pray with my mind, I will sing with my spirit, I will sing with my mind. To you who are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say Amen to your thanksgiving, since he doesn't know what you're saying? Perhaps the strongest effort of those who seek to uphold instrumental music revolves around the word salo. The claim is the use of the word inherently involves the use of instruments. It's interesting to con in consideration at this point that if the word salo inherently involves playing mechanical instruments, then they cease to be an opinion and become mandatory. If they are mandatory, then we are in violation of Scripture if they are not used, and to violate God's law is a, con is a constitutional sin. It's also worthy of note that if the mechanical instruments of music are inherent in sallow, that the apostles in the first century of church also sinned, in view of the fact that history shows they did not use instruments in their services. We need to consider that while the word does mean to pluck or twang, the particular instrument is not inherent in the word. In other words, the context set determines what is plucked or twanged. Let's look at the verb. In the New Testament, it is translated in every case by the word sing, except Ephesians 5.19, where it is translated by the principle making me melody. <coughs> Singing and making melody. First, we notice that wise men can understand what the will of the Lord is. Therefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The will of God, not the will of man. Man can understand God's will, that he has given us in his word. Second, it's God's will that we be not filled, dissipated, and drunk with wine and strong drink. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Third, the main verb in the next sentence is be filled. Instead of being filled with wine, the child of God is to be commanded to be filled with the Spirit. The word of God is filled with the Spirit of God. Jesus said, the words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. In Ephesians 19 is a parallel passage in Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. Let's look at five participal actions resulting with a child of God is filled with the Spirit. Speaking, 
Paul commands, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. <clears throat> to use words in order to declare one's mind, to disclose one's thoughts, to speak. When we sing, we're speaking words to declare the thoughts of our mind and heart. An instrument of music can do a lot of things, and someone said the violin is the nearest thing to duplicating a human voice. But it cannot speak words to communicate praise to God. Actually, this speaking is another synonym for singing. The speaking is a reciprocal action, usually the native person, speaking to one another, to yourselves, mutually, one another. Psalms, hymns, spiritual song. We have here three species of singing. There's only a slight difference, as we shall notice, between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, uh, striking the chord, a musical instrument, hence a pious song, a psalm. Psalming is used of one who has it in his heart to sing or recite a song of sorts. Spiritual, belonging to the divine spirit, exhibiting effects and so his character, divinely inspired, redolent of the Holy Spirit. Songs, song which Moses and Christ taught them to sing. Song of praise. Therefore, this speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is defi definitively the next participle, singing. Singing is the second participle related to the leading verb, be filled, singing. Singing, uh, in both passages, a lyrical emotion of a devout and grateful soul. Be filled with the speak, making melody in your heart. As stated previously, making melody is translated in every instance by sing, except in the present case. Many of the online definitions of song are too brief and do not adequately accurately give the etymology and true meaning of the word as it was used in New Testament times. Making melody, to pluck, to pull out, to twang, to touch or strike a chord, to twang the instruments of the uh, twang the strings of a musical instrument so they may gentle vibrate. To play on a stringed instrument, to play the harp, to sing the music of the harp, Notice, to sing a hymn, to celebrate the praise of God in song. Sallow, I will sing God's praise and deal with my whole soul, stirred and borne away by the Holy Spirit. But I also follow reason as my guide, so what I sing may be understood alike by myself and by the hearers. <clears throat> Notice the root meaning of sallow is to rub, wipe, handle, touch. Therefore, down through the ages of development, sallow has several definitions, with the root meaning always present. Let's notice these changing, use, these changing uses of the word as translated sing in the New Testament. In the days of Aeschylus, Salah was used the idea of pulling or plucking the hair. In the same sense, Salah was used to express the action of the archer in twanging or plucking the bowstring. Next, in developing connotation, we find the, in the days of Euripides, the verb means to cause, to vibrate by touching, to twang, to touch, to strike a chord, to twang the strings of a musical instrument, so they're gentle. In the days of Aristotle and Plutarch, Psalm almost absolutely meant means to play it on a instrument to play the harp, to sing to the music of the harp. Notice again the root meaning of rub touch is involved in the evolving meaning of this verb. But many advocates of instrumental music fail to mention that by the times of the New Testament the verb sallow had come to mean exclusively to sing or chant. Notice the last definition given by Thea. <clears throat> In the New Testament sing a hymn, the praise of God is song. I will sing God's praises, and even my whole soul stirred and borne away by the Holy Spirit, I will also follow reason as my guide as to what I sing may be understood alike by myself and by my listeners. Even in the instance of the word sing, the root idea of sound is still present, because when a person sings, the vocal cords vibrate to produce melodious sounds. In Ephesians 5.19, in the only instance where sound is translated make melody, it conveys the idea of figuratively chanting in the human heart, the inner man. In your heart, cardia human, is the seat of center of all physical and spiritual life, the center and seat of spiritual life, the soul or mind, the fountain and the seat of thoughts. Therefore, there is no case that can be made for instrumental music and worship to God based on the verb solo. The worship music of the New Testament church was and is singing. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our worship, let us always be thankful to God the Father. Submitting to one another is difficult for many people today, especially when we live in a free society. Yes, the same, yet the same word is used to instruct us to submit to the governing power. Children are to submit to parents, wives are to submit to husbands, and all are to submit to God. 
So Solomon made her found to plucking the bee on the bowstring and carpenters lying the harp, but it's perfectly clear from the text that the instrument to be plucked and twanged is the heart. Speaking to one of the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. Remember that proving that a word can mean to pluck the strings of an instrument does not prove such in the case of Ephesians, Colossians, or any other New Testament passage. The context must be the damning factor in the Ephesians and Colossian letters. The heart is should be the instrument under consideration. Some say only the basis of fellowship is rooted simply into what one believes regarding the person of Jesus. Perhaps the falsehood being taught is about the person of Christ. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what else you do or whatever, what else you believe. We're all one in Christ. If that were the case, then why should we be concerned about false teachers? In the New Testament, singing is authorized by God. Singing is clearly authorized to worship. Some passages refer to singing are, and when they sung a hymn, they went out in the mouth. When they sang praises, sing unto thy name. I will sing with the Spirit and sing with understanding. Singing and making melody in our heart. Singing with grace in our hearts. If anyone is afflicted, let him pray. If any merry, let him sing psalms. <clears throat> I will sing praises unto you. The fruit of your lips. These passages clearly show the authorization to sing. It should also be pointed out that not only are we authorized to sing, we're commanded to sing. We need to study carefully and remember frequently lessons from past regarding our disrespect for the authority of the Word of God. We need to strive for unity and not division in our teaching and practice. And whatever you do in word and thought, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech that you walk worthy of the vocation whenon you are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offence contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you speak the same thing, there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, mature, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, the God of love. Unity is indeed good and unpleasant, and we should and must endeavour to have it. But it must not be unity based on compromise, but upon truth. The truth should not be for sale. The truth is not in the auction block to be sold to the highest bidder or done away with, but remains firmly rooted in the rock of ages. God originated it, Christ lived it, the Holy Spirit revealed it, we must be faithful to it and preach it in its purity and simplicity. The issue of mechanical instrument of music and worship has been a long-standing point of controversy. Yet, as we have seen so far, by the Holy Spirit's choice, it was never used in the congregation of God's people in the first century. I feel sure that many people who read this this far will have much surprise to learn that several centuries of church history elapsed before the introduction of instrumental music. Those who have tried to find authority for why they use instruments in church have been hard put to find any mention of such an innovation during the first six centuries of church history. An elaborate attempt has been made to enlist Clement of Alexandria as a fast witness in favour of instrument music in the church. Clement was a Greek theologian who taught in Alexandria and was prominent in church affairs from around 192 AD up to his death, 215. Joseph Bingham, the eminent scholar of antiquities of the Christian church, unhesitatingly says, Clement rather argues that instrumental music, the lute and the harp of which he speaks, was not in use in the public churches. But this is not all. Some eminent scholars have pronounced in the conviction that the passage now under review is beyond all doubt an interpolation. That means added by someone else. Johann Caspar Sousa, a noted Latin writer of the 17th century, makes certain quotations of Clement, among which is the following. Superfluous music is to be rejected because it breaks and variously affects the mind. Saucer draws his point in conclusion, nothing therefore has Clement written which would favour organs in the present day use, even the least yea directly to the contrary. It is simply impossible to interpret Clement in support of instrumental music in Christian worship without involving him in an unaccountable self-contradiction, Curfew says. Next in order of supposed witness summoned by in favour of instrumental music is Ambrose, Bishop of Milan. Milan. Uh, Mr. Coffey's has made such an exhaustive study of the matter, states, We only make the point here that the evidence thus far adduced in support of the claim is not only not conclusive, but points decidedly to the conclusion that Ambrose, at any rate, never introduced it. In fact, McClinton Strong says, Neither Ambrose, nor Basil, nor Christotum and the noble Ecumens, which they severely pronounced on music, made any mention of instrumental music. 
Mr. Coffey's next quote from several authorities on music and church customs, he cites Dr. Ritter, director of the School of Music at Vassar College. We have no real knowledge of the exact character of the music which formed a part of the religious devotion of the early Christian congregation. It was, however, purely vocal. Instrumental music was excluded at first as would be used by the Romans at the depraved festivities, and everything reminded them of the heathen worship could not be endured by the new religionists. Edward Dickinson, Professor of History of Music. David formerly sang in psalms, also we sing with him. We had a lyre with lifeless strings, the church had a lyre with living strings. Our tongues are the strings of the lyre, with a different tone indeed, but with far more accordant piety. Professor Dickinson remarks also concerning Augustine. He adjured believers not to turn their hearts to theatrical instruments. The religious guides of the early Christians felt that there would be an incongruity in the use of instrumental sound in the worship. The pure vocal utterance was a far more popular expression of their faith. At this point we could ask, if all the testimony of the early church fathers is against the use of instruments in the church, then just when did the attitude change? The American Encyclopedia states Pope Vitalian is related to have first introduced organs into some of the churches of Western Europe about 670 AD. But the earliest trustworthy account is that of, of one sent as a present by Greek Emperor Constantine to Pepin. Pepin in turn presented the organ to, or to the Church of St. Tron at Compiègne. But students of ecclesiastical archaeology have generally agreed that instrument music was not used in churches till a much later date. Thomas Aquinas, our church does not use musical instruments or harps and psalteries to praise God with all, that she may not seem to Judaize. That's 1250 AD. For this passage, we can strongly say that there were no ecclesi ecclesiastical use of organs in the time of Aquinas. It's alleged that Marinus Sanitus, who lived about 1290, was the first to brought the use of wind organs in the church buildings. At the, Ref at the Reformation, the organs were discarded, being considered the vilest remains of popery. It may come as a surprise to many to learn that the Eastern Orthodox Church which according to the World Almanac for 1955 numbers 125,000 uh, members, never has at any time in its history introduced instrumental music. <clears throat> John Bingham says, nor was it the organ ever received into Greek churches, there being no mention of an organ in all the liturgies, ancient or modern. McClintock and Strong says, never has neither, never has neither the organ nor any instrument been employed in public worship in Eastern churches, nor is it mention of, of instrumental music found in all of the liturgies, ancient and modern. Professor John Gabadu, in his work on music in the church, it has thus been proved by an appeal to historical facts that the church, although lapsing more and more into defection from the truth and into a corruption of apostolic practice, had no instrumental music for 1,200 years. He means very few congregations used them during this period. The Calvinist Reformation ejected it from its services as an element of popery. Even the Church of England, having come very near to its exclusion from worship, the historical argument therefore combines with the scriptural to raise a solemn and powerful protest against its employment by the Presbyterian Church. It is a heresy. Adam Clark, Methodist, I believe the use of such instruments of music in the Christian Church is without the sanction and against the will of God that they are subversive to the spirit of true devotion. I never knew them to be productive of any good in the worship of God. Music is a science I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God, I abominate and behoa. John Wesley, best known of all Methodist ministers, I have no objection to the organ in our chapel, provided it neither seen nor heard. John Calvin, the great reformer, musical instruments in celebration of praise of God would be no more suitable than burning of incense lighting of lamps and restoration, restoration of other shadows of the law. Spurgeon, notice Baptist, used no instrument in his service. The first Baptist churches did use instrumental music worship, and its introduction aroused bitter opposition. The primitive Baptists have never used instrumental music in their worship. The Church of England in 1560 had to decide whether to continue in the Catholic tradition or go back to biblical standards, and the instrumental music was finally adopted by a vote of 59 to 58. The 59 vote was a proxy vote, and again, there was bitter opposition. Lyman Coleman, Presbyterian scholar, he says, <coughs> it's generally admitted that the primitive Christians employed no instrumental music in their religious worship. 
Luther, Martin Luther found the Lutherism said, the organ is the, in the worship of God is an ensign of Baal. Free Fres Presbyterian Church, the so we free do not use an instrument of music even today. <coughs> the Alexander Campbell, the founder of the Disciples of Christ, was strong in his rejection of music, music in the church. A year after Mr. Campbell died, one of his prominent followers, Dr. Christopher, made a stirring appeal against the use of instruments in the church. He said, in part, I cannot therefore see in all my horizon one fact, argument, reason or plea that can justify us in using mus musical instruments to worship of the church. It is an innovation on apostolic practice. Let us learn from the experience of others and be content with what God has ordained, suffer instrument music and all its non-comments to remain where they were born amid the corruption of an apostate church. Pend Pendleton wrote, this tendency of the religious feeling of the American people is well portrayed in a recent article in New York Herald. The public worship New York now wreaks is religious music. No pleading on the part of elder elderly clergy for the simplicity of form has been to any avail. Presbyterians have fallen into it, but Methodists exhort its musical notes, Episcopalians cantillate everything, Catholics are becoming more so. The Baptists only as a body have held aloof and kept to the letter of the original simplicity, and these will no doubt gradually soften and mingle in the general pulp. Instruments of music were relatively new things to these churches in 1868. The Baptists were the only ones in New York who were said not to have them. Yet many sincere people think that these religious groups have used instruments of music from time immemorial. Even if all the above were agreed that it could be used in worship, that would not change what the Bible says, and there ought to be the key to every debate on that ought to be the key to every debate on the subject. David Massey Shepherd was asked if the early church used instrumental music in worship, he replied no. It was used in temple service, but it was not brought into the synagogue. Pagan cults used it in the worship. They were in instruments of music used in pagan worship, but not in the church worship. When instruments eventually came in, they were not used to accompany the singing, but to give the pitch. This continued down to the Middle Ages. It was first used in a Jewish synagogue in Berlin in 1815, under the bitter and violent protest of many of the members. The civil authorities were appealed to. Its use prohibited and not permitted until 1818, and even then a Jew was not allowed to play. A non-Jew organist was employed. It was not introduced in the synagogue by American Jews until 1840. They began to use an organ at the Temple of Beth Elohim in Charleston, South Carolina. The opposition was exceedingly bitter. A vote sued 46 to 40 in favour of its adoption. The matter was taken to the civil court. The decision was against the minority. The case was appealed, but lost again in 1846. The minority then withdrew and organised a separate congregation. Notice how time after time those who wanted to induce instruments could be prepared to destroy a congregation in order to have their own way. But I'll now briefly trace the history and of the introduction and general acceptance of instrumental music in Christian worship and testimony. We've seen it was very reluctantly accepted by the church and didn't gain general approval until after the Reformation. The character of the company made it first brought in was comparatively simple, being limited to that of the organ, as illustrated in the gift of Constantine to Pepe in 1670. Today we find ourselves surrounded by a strange spectacle. Instrumental music in multiple forms has not only been generally accepted by the professing church, it has largely displaced, displaced the reading of the Word of God and the sound, solid preaching of the Word. It is almost as if what God has to say about anything no longer matters. It seems more important we feel good and can please ourselves. I hear quote a paragraph from a four-page pamphlet entitled Music in the Assemblies. This is the age of hymnology. Dependence today is placed upon religious music to stir the emotions. The Word of God is given second place and the sword of the Spirit is sheathed during 50 or 60 or more percent of radio programs. Music is placed so much to the fore and made so attractive that when the Word is finally pre preached, the audience has lost its desire for the word. We hear quote parts of Dr. Uh, Mr. Darby's remarks as recorded in his published letters. He was a friend of D.L. Moody. I rejoice, I'm bound to rejoice in every soul converted, must be so, and saved for, for, for forever. Nor do I do, doubt Moody's earnestness, for I know the man well. I see that God is using extraordinary means to awaken his sleeping saints, but I am not carried away by it. As to the result of it as a whole, it will not last. I fully judge will foster worldliness in the saints. Individuals may be converted, 
we must rejoice at that. The effect on the Church of God will be mischievous. Mr. Moody's work avowedly mixes up Christianity with the world and worldly influences and uses them because it tells in favour of his work and fosters worldliness and the evils of Christendom. He mixes activities with what, with, with what was of the flesh so as to injure Christians and mix up the saints and the world. Dr. Moody's work is said to have been the biggest impact on introducing and making popular the instrument in our worship services today. Here's a quote from 400 Question Answers compiled by H.B. Kuda. As a reality of Christ departs from the soul, ritualism takes a place and forms without life rise up on every hand. To such an extent has this grown that even the world is losing respect for a Christianity which seems more bent on entertaining than converting men. We believe, therefore, that any use of instrumental music and worship of God from end to end in a Sunday school, the gospel reading, or any other, will be found to have a tendency to lower the character of Christianity itself. One is persuaded that the last century of church history has witnessed an accelerating decline in a tone of worship and testimony. <clears throat> there is a steady conviction that the increased emphasis on the use of musical instruments coupled with secular type hymnology has been a major contributor, contributor to the downgrade movement. In many cases, the infatuation with musical display has gone so far that elaborate rehearsals of purely musical talent are offered from the preaching platform. Instead of the earnest, solemn pleading of the spirit-filled preacher of God's good news concerning his son, there is heard the clatter of the xylophone, the strumming of the guitar, the plainful wail of the violin, or the blare of the trumpet and saxophone, and all this in the name of Christ. Again, look at its effects in modern evangelism. It has made a new sort of entertainment. And instead of converts marked by having a wept in a repentance over sin, by keen separation even from the garment spotted by it, and by a spirit of prayer and devotedness to Christ, it has formed in them a trifling, pleasure-loving mind, destructive of true Christianity. Shall we, dear brethren, who are heirs of such holy testimony, betray our trust and yield to the pressure and pattern of the day, to nullify the prestigious heritage. Rather, may we hear the Spirit of God speaking to us afresh. I give you charge in the sight of God who quickens all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that you keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of singing, praise is in thanksgiving to the Lord, teaching and admonishing one another. Singing Christian worship is to instruct, communicate ideas from one to another, to admonish, admonish those engaged to rightly living, in addition to being a medium of praise, thanksgiving and supplication to God. The manner of the rendition unto God directed as a praise to God and not for entertainment. Music and worship must not de de degenerate into an effort to entertain. We are singing to please God, not the multitude. In spirit, with the heart. From these scriptures we learn that our hearts must be accompanying our singing and be in accord with the sentiment of the song being sung. It must be done in sincerity. With the understanding. One can hardly sing sincerely what one cannot understand. We need to study the sentiments of the song be sure it is scriptural and that we understand its meaning in order to make that meaning a sentiment of our heart. So as to be understood, psalms and hymns appear to be used interchangeably, not only to convey the character in general the songs to be sung, but in particular that such compositions are to be spiritual. Nowhere in the New Testament Christ's covenant with all men is there mention of man-made instruments being used in singing praises to God. The one instrument which is mentioned is the heart. It is unnecessary to add any other. Indeed, it is dangerous to do so, considering the consequences of disobeying God. So why would we want to do that? Let us follow the law of the spirit of life in Christ. In view of all the evidence cited as to the absence of music in the first 700 years of the church history, in view of the stormy opposition that had been encountered during the next 700 years, in view of the pious opposition to it well on into the 19th century, may we not just conclude that the history of the Church of God on earth is overwhelmingly opposed to the introduction of musical instruments into worship and the testimony of the body of Christ today. Mechanical instruments of worship to God are unauthorized, unscriptural and unacceptable and all the efforts to justify and to make it a matter of opinion have been, have been and continue to be and will continue to be in vain. 
Look at the effect of instruments in co Christian congregations. It was to help them sing at first. Now dumb in praise to God they are instead getting a treat for themselves from musical art and being entertained. Is it any wonder that people compare the theatre with the church? They're both out to entertain and give pleasure. What God wants becomes secondary to what I want. Those who look at the Old Testament just for the desire for instrument music and worship show a drastic misunderstanding of the distinction between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. Several questions need to be addressed in the final analysis. Do we need instruments to sing? No. Is there a serious danger in introducing them to assist in singing? Yes. Was the first century church guided in all the areas of worship by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Did it follow the synagogue vocal musical tradition? Yes. Could it have followed the temple tradition? No. Why? Because it wasn't authorized by the Holy Spirit. Do we want to get back to Bible teaching and follow apostolic practice as best as we're able 2,000 years later? Yes. If it's necessary, if it's not necessary, <coughs> it is dangerous to true worship, was not part of the divinely inspired pattern of worship for the New Testament church. Should we then introduce instruments into our worship today? No, most definitely not. It was introduced to please people and entertain in some way, and these are not reasons for practicing it. For our congregation, if our congregation singing is poor, the answer is to practice, not to add an unnecessary and dangerous prop into worship. Using an instrument in worship may be necessary seen by some to be sinful, <coughs> but it can lead to sinful practices in split churches. It is therefore most unwise. To play or not to play? The question of use of instrument music. The conclusion, therefore, is to sing in worship, not to play in worship, is clearly the answer to the question.